new two and the trailer for the the um, container leaves at three. Okay, so so a little bit before noon, getting in the Twin Cities. So leaving here, say at nine thirty, you'll get there on time. Uh, it's a smaller trailer. I've pulled it behind my small <laughs> Ford Ranger for about five thousand miles as I used to live in Waseca and commuted back and forth. So just about anything can pull this trailer. Um, if you would be willing to do that, if you would let me know or let Ruth know or Roy know, um, we can coordinate that with you and make sure everything's set. Uh, we appreciate your help with that. Lots of things going on. We want you to be part of Read the bulletins, be part of what we have going here at Glory Baptist Church. If you haven't been here, if you're new, I've been working my way through the book of Esther. Esther is an Old Testament book. If you don't know where Esther's at, um, open kind of the middle of your Bible, you'll find Psalms, and then work your way forward just a little bit towards the front of the book. Before you get to Nehemiah, there's Esther. Okay, And we're going to be in Esther pretty much all day. Esther 4, 10 through 17 is going to be my focus. And as we've been going through this, we've had some main characters that I just briefly want to review. Um, we first met King Ahasuerus, who we're more familiar with by his Greek name. His Greek name is King Xerxes. If you've seen the movie 300, that's the same guy. King Xerxes. So we had King Xerxes, and we talked about him the first couple of weeks, and, and came to the conclusion unanimously that Xerxes is a Xerxes. He's not a nice guy. Okay, so, so we all voted, and we wouldn't have voted him in if we had a choice. But he's king, so we didn't get a choice. So you've got Xerxes. And then you've got a couple other characters. You, you, you've got, of course, Esther, who the book is named after, who we're going to spend most of today talking about. Uh, Esther becomes the queen after King Xerxes gives the boot to his previous queen, Queen Vashti. Um, and so she's out of the picture. Esther comes in and ends up winning kind of the bachelorette and gets the job to be the queen. Um, and along the way, uh, the other character that's related to her is a guy by the name of Mordecai. Mordecai would have been her uncle, but he's also her adoptive father. And so he's, uh, he's on her side of things as far as it goes. And then the other guy we talked about is a guy by the name of Haman. Now, Haman was an Agagite, which doesn't mean most to most of us, mean much to most of us. But you need to know that the Agagites were the people when the Jews first came into Israel and they got settled into the land of milk and honey, the land of plenty, the, the promised land that God had promised them. They get there, they get settled. Who's the first people who attacks the Jews? The Israelites. It's the Agagites. And so they've been enemies for a long, long time when we get into this story. And so what had happened was there was a plot against the life of the king. Mordecai, who was working in the government, hears about it. He passes the information along to Esther saying, hey, there's a hit out on your husband. You probably should tell him. So she tells the king. The king investigates. Sure enough, these two guys are plotting to kill the king. They get killed, as you would expect. You plot to kill the king, you're going to get killed. So at this point, the logical part of the story is, of course, Mordecai has just saved the king's life. He should get some sort of reward, right? He gets the golden chariot or whatever it might be. He gets a day named after him or something. But no. Instead, this Haman guy, this Agagite, he gets a promotion. Nothing for Mordecai. Well, then Haman, he's kind of a proud guy. He wants everybody to kind of bow down to him a little bit. Well, Mordecai decides, I'm not going to do that. So when everybody else is bowing down, there's one guy standing there. Going, eh, I'm not bowing to this guy. Right? Well, of course, that antagonizes him and... Uh, and then Haman says, well, I don't like you, and I don't like your people, so he gets the king's permission to begin a genocide against the Jews, to wipe them out of all of Persia. We're talking millions of people that would have their lives at risk. And so at this point in the story, Haman's been put in charge, he's been given the king's authority, they've issued a decree that says on this day, we're going to kill all the Jews. The problem is, Mordecai and Esther are Jews. But nobody knows it at that point in the story. They haven't been public with their faith. They've been kind of just casual, at best, people of faith. But as we saw last week, Mordecai kind of realized, hey, if I don't start saying something, they're going to kill us all. So he started lamenting. He started wearing sackcloth and ashes. He went out in the streets and started complaining. And that's going to bring us... Uh, to where we're at today. Mordecai finally got active, finally started making progress in his faith. And within that, he began to urge Esther 
to get active and begin making some spiritual progress as well. And, and one of the things we talked about last week was if you're kind of in a rut, if you haven't been going somewhere spiritually, the good news is you're not alone. There's lots of people in the Bible who've been there. I've been there. And God hasn't forgotten you. Um, and my encouragement to you would, would be to activate your faith, to get going, to start taking steps forward. And that's what we're going to see Esther do here today. Um, she's going to make some decisions, and she's going to put her neck on the line, literally, to start to make spiritual progress. And that should be encouragement. That should give us all hope. That these people in the story had gone for many, many years with no spiritual growth. And now they're finally starting to get moving. So that brings us to Esther 4, uh, verses 10 through 17. And there it says, Then Esther spoke to Hathach, who was a eunuch, uh, and, and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say. So this is the first time we see Esther actively taking part. She's commanding somebody. She's a queen, and she's taking charge finally, right? She's telling somebody to do something. She's acting like a leader. She's taking some initiative. She's no longer just concerned about herself, but it shows she's beginning to be concerned about God's people. And so she says, go, go to Mordecai and, and talk to him and say, all the king's servants and the people of the king's province know that if any man or any woman goes to the king inside of the inner courts without being called by the king, there is but one law, to be put to death except for those whom the king holds out his golden scepter to so that they might live. But as for me, she says, I have not been called to come to the king for 30 days. So here's what she's saying. She says, I, I, I want to do something, but it's, it's dangerous. And that's what faith actually is, as we are talking about the persecuted church a, mo church a moment ago. Faith, faith is action in the face of opposition. And so she's looking at her situation and, and she's saying, okay, the only way for me to get to the king, to get him to reverse this decree that's going to kill all of the Jews, and I'm a Jew, the only way for me to get to the king and to talk to him about this is I'm going to have to go in without being called. I need to go see my husband, but see, he hasn't called me for 30 days, right? And he's been sitting on his throne, and as we know, he's a guy who likes to sit on his throne and have everybody come bow down before him. He likes to sit in there and kind of throw parties and have some drinks, and he wasn't a nice guy, as we learned the first couple of weeks. And the rule of the land is, if you just go up to the king and he hasn't summoned you, they kill you. And so there's no repeat offenders for that offense, right? Now there was, as they've studied archaeology in this region, there's this ancient archaeological dig where they found this picture, and it was a picture of Persian, Persian King Xerxes sitting on his throne that we talked about that very first week. And he had this enormous throne that he loved to sit on. And, and in this picture, you have Xerxes sitting on the throne, but then you have this big guy standing behind him with a giant axe. Right? And so, everybody knew this. And you were like, I need to go see the king, but uh, no, 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 uh, uh, hold on. Whatever my issue is, it's not big enough for that, right? It's like, I kind of like my neck, yeah? I kind of like where my head is located at the moment. You, you walk into his room and you haven't been summoned, and the guy with the axe is like, hey, come on in, what you doing today? Why don't you put your head right there? Well, why is that? Well, I'll show you in a minute, right? That, that's the kind of greeting you would have gotten. And so, not the right way to do things, but an effective way. I mean, if you're the king, this really reduces your distractions. It keeps your calendar nice and open. Uh, that's how it works, right? I mean, if you're the king, you don't want constant interruptions. You don't always want people walking in on you. And so you make this rule. You take a few heads off. People start to listen. And the rule of the day was you are only allowed to see this king if he invites you. And so then they told Mordecai what Esther had said, Scripture tells us. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther. Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape more than any of the Jews. Now, we don't know, but this might be a thinly veiled threat by Mordecai. 
At this point, there's only one person who knows that Esther's a Jew, and that's Mordecai. And Mordecai says, if they kill the Jews, you're Jewish. They're going to kill you too. So it might be that he's manipulating the situation. It kind of looks like that. And uh, if so, not really a nice thing for a dad to say to his daughter, his adoptive daughter. Basically saying, if they come for us, they're coming for you. We're letting them know that you're a Jew. So he's putting her neck on the line too. And then he says, for if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But we'll get to that in a moment. But he says, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether, you have come, whether or not you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. So then Esther wants to reply, and she replies to Mordecai. And this is where she's finally starting to take action. She's getting active in her faith. She's making some progress. She's got a hard decision to make. Maybe you've been there before. Had a hard decision to make. Am I, am I going to take the risk to live out my faith and endure whatever consequences come from that? Am I willing to do that? Will I live out my faith regardless of the consequences? Let me say, I, I, I'm not... I'm not some naive kind of, you know, rosy bunnies and hugs, muffins kind of preacher. That's not me. I'm not going to be the one who tells you, you know, just do what God tells you to do and it's all going to be great, right? Because that's not scriptural. And in fact, there's other guys in the Bible who got their heads chopped off, right? And they were just doing what God told them to do. John the baptizer, right? John got his head lopped off because some lady didn't like the message he was preaching. And if you read the rest of the Bible, you'll find a, a bunch of things where people were faithful and it was painful. And I don't want to give away all the rest of the story, but it's not like the story ends and they lived happily ever after about Xerxes and his wife. I mean, it would be great if I could tell you, oh yeah, Xerxes' heart was changed and he had a conversion and he came to know Yahweh God and they went and planted a megachurch and had 27 kids and they all became missionaries to China, right? That's not what happens. It didn't go like that. And so sometimes, through our sins or the sins of others, the difficulty of circumstances, the situations we get ourselves into, we find ourselves going, I'm in a bad place. And if I make a decision now to obey God, it could get worse for me. What do I do? Sometimes we find ourselves in a position that we've gotten ourselves into. If we're faithful, it might not go so well for us. It might get worse. And that's where Esther is. She's at that spot. And as I said, faith is action, right? Faith is doing. Faith involves some risk-taking. So what's Esther going to do? Well, we see right before our very eyes here in Esther 4 that she matures. She begins to make progress. And I believe here she is demonstrating her faith in the Lord. And so here's what she says in, in verse 15, chapter 4. It says, Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go and gather all the Jews that are to be found in Susa. So she's bringing all of God's people together. She's gathering in God's people. She says, We need to get together on this. Now sometimes in the Western world, when, you, when we read this story, it's, it's, it's like Esther's this lone figure, right? And she's doing all this work. But she's not. When Esther reached a difficult point, she tells Mordecai, we need to go get the people of God. And that's some wise advice for each and every one of us. When we're struggling, when we're worried, when things aren't going as we think they need to be going, we shouldn't go it alone. Instead, get with the people of God. And so she says, Gather all the Jews to be found in Susa, and hold a fast on my behalf. Do not eat or drink for three days or nights. And so she's saying, I need God's people to help me. Pray for me. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm scared. I could be killed. The only reason that I'm queen 
is that Vashti didn't obey a rule. And now, I'm going to have to disobey a rule. I'm going to put my neck on the line. Get the people of God together. Pray and fast for me. And every time the Bible speaks about fasting, it does so in the context of fasting and prayer together. But here it's interesting that she just says, only fast. I don't know why the Bible says it that way. Maybe prayer is inferred. I think it probably is. But it doesn't actually say pray for me. It just says fast for me. But I do think the people of God were praying for her as well. And then she says this. Once you do this, Esther says, once you fast for me for three days and three nights, then I will go to the king. That's faith. I don't know at what point in this series of life where she really comes into faith. But at this point of the story, we know she has faith. They've been married for over five years. We know that. And finally, she's taking her faith seriously and putting it into action. And when the people of God in the Bible, when they meet God, they change. You can't have an experience of the living God and not be changed for it. And what you're going to see here in chapter 4 is that Esther changes. Mordecai has changed. They're not perfect, but they're making progress. And that's what it is to be a believer. We are not perfect. I am not perfect. You are not perfect. Sorry to pop that balloon this morning. You're not perfect. But if you're making progress, if you're moving forward, if you're growing, that is a believer. You can't meet the living God and not be changed. And as they did, maybe you've had a season of rebellion. Maybe you've had that season of life of backsliding. Maybe you're in it now. But that doesn't mean God has forsaken you or abandoned you or forgotten about you. And today might be the day for you to start taking those steps forward to make some progress. The only characters in this story who don't make progress are Haman and Xerxes. We don't see any change in them. They don't make any progress. They're the same at the end as they were at the beginning. But people who do know God, they change. There's progress. And Esther is changing. So she says, I'm going to go see the king. She's getting brave. She's getting courageous. And there's great faith here. She says, I'm going to go see the king, even though it's against the law. Now, we as Christians believe that we should generally follow human laws. That we should, like Romans 13 says, obey. But there are times where obeying those laws go against God. And that's when God's law trumps man's law. And so Esther's going to put her neck on the line. And the issue is, you know, thou shalt not murder, right? But Haman wants to murder millions and millions of innocent people because he's bitter against one Jewish guy, Mordecai. The punishment does not fit the crime. And so Esther is going to put her neck on the line. She's going to disobey the law. And, and she's going to go in and see if the king will reconsider and here's the line that Esther says, probably the most memorable line of the entirety of the book. Esther says, I'm going to go see the king after the three days of fasting. And here's what she says. She says, if I perish, I perish. And then Mordecai went away and did everything that Esther had ordered him to do. She's finally making some decisions. Previously, she didn't share her faith. She hasn't let anybody know that she's one of God's people. But here she's taking it on and saying, all right, I have to do something. I got to lead. I am responsible. God has put me in this place for this time. And Mordecai, as I said in Esther 14, 414, says, if you keep silent at this time, he tells Esther, God's going to find another way. See, here's the thing. We can't thwart God's plan. And if we are unwilling to serve, if we are unwilling to do our part, Mordecai reminds Esther, then God's going to find another way. God is going to provide a Savior. But I think 
He has put you here and now for this. Now this is probably the first place in the Bible where it intimates the presence of God. We've spoken about this before in Esther. Nowhere in the book of Esther does it actually mention God's name. But I think here we see very clearly God entering into the story. And here's the truth that we need to see in this story. Because they weren't living for God. If you remember, these people are in Susa because of the judgment of God. They had been captured in the Babylonian captivity, taken out of Israel as prisoners, had to serve as slaves for generations. Finally, a new king comes along and says, you're free to go home. Go back to Israel. Now, a lot of the Jews did that. But a bunch of the Jews said, nah, we kind of like it here. I think we'll stick around. The problem is, if you were a Jew, God has commanded you to live in Israel. And so you are breaking God's commandment and law by not being obedient. Because you can't go to the temple when you live in Susa. You can't go make offerings. You can't go do the things you are commanded to do to be a religiously responsible Jew. And so they're disobediently living in this land. And Mordecai and Esther haven't been living out their faith. But despite that, despite all of those things, God does not abandon them. And the same is true for us. If you haven't been living for God, if you've been struggling, maybe somebody in your life hasn't been living for God and they're struggling, know that God is still pursuing them. That God will not forsake us, will not abandon us, will not leave us, will not leave us alone. You may be saying, yeah, I've been walking the wrong direction in my relationship with God. And we think that creates distance between us and Him. But the truth of the matter is, God is walking there with you wherever you go. Read the story of Jonah. You can't run from God. He is always there. The Bible says even when we are faithless, He is faithful. The most common command in all of the Bible is fear not. There are a lot of reasons to be afraid in this world. Mordecai has reason here to be afraid. His stubbornness could lead to the death of millions of people. And every time I've read the Bible and it says fear not, it immediately says then what? For I am with you. The reason we are not to fear is that God is with us. He's always with His people. God is with His people in sin. God is with His people when they are obedient. God is with His people. And so, as we read the story and as we go through this, it's important for us to understand these things, that God is not going to leave us. But Mordecai and Esther are in this dire place. Difficult, distressing circumstances. But Mordecai has finally come to his senses Esther's finally kind of got the big picture of what's going on. And they are in a bad, bad place. Now how many of you have ever been there before? Can you connect with this? Can you, can you feel this? That you've struggled, you've found yourself in a dark place, and you've wondered, if I, if I do what God wants me to do here, it might get a little uncomfortable. I've been there. I've been there. Been there a number of times. And it's frightening not knowing where God is going to lead. But God is with us. That is the big picture of the story today. And when the Bible says that there's sin, that means that that's not what God wants for us. But we also need to understand that God has providence. That despite our sin, that God is still in control. And He is still good. God is sovereign. He is in charge. We are not. If you only think that God is good, but He's not sovereign, well, that means He means well, but He can't do anything about your problems. If you only think that He's sovereign, but He's not good, that means you think He's in charge, but He's an awful lot like King Xerxes. But the good news for us is God is both sovereign and good. You may have heard of this guy, A.W. Tozer, and he had a, a beautiful analogy for this. He's this old Bible teacher, if you don't know who he was, an author. And A.W. Tozer says, envision this, that there's a ship where there's a captain, and this captain is determined to get the boat to port. 
And they're going to take this long journey across a very rough sea. But he's determined they're going to get to port. Now ultimately that captain is in charge. He's in control. He's the sovereign. But on that ship there's many other people, many other passengers. And those passengers get to make lots of decisions along the way. They're free to make those decisions. They interact and they can do all kinds of things. But ultimately, the captain is going to get that ship to port. And so that means that all the decisions that are being made by all those who are along for this voyage, they're morally responsible for them. If they're sinning, if they're rebelling, if they're causing mutiny, if they're harming one another, whatever they do, they are responsible for that. But you see, the captain's will cannot be overtaken. Because that captain is going to get that ship to port. And when we talk about the providence of God, that's what we're talking about. People make decisions and we're responsible for them. So Esther and Mordecai are going to make decisions. And they're going to make some bad ones and they're responsible for those. And they're going to make some good ones. And the credit to them, they're responsible for those as well. But ultimately, God's will will be accomplished. God will get us home. And so what he's saying here is, Esther, if you don't respond like you're supposed to, God is still in control. We can make some bad decisions, but at the end, God is going to get the ship to port. I've been there, and I understand this. Maybe you do too. And so Esther's statement then in in Esther 4.16, and and I've read it, but we'll read it again here. She says, All right, go and gather the Jews. Everybody in Susa, have them fast on my behalf. Basically, let's have a big church service. Don't eat or drink for three days or nights. And then I'm going to go to the king. If I perish, I perish, she says. Esther's greatest treasure in all of life is her life itself, right? And she's willing to say, I'm willing to take the thing that is most important to me, my life, and I'm going to put it on the line here. Because my life is not actually the most important thing. The greatest treasure is my relationship with God. See, the Bible tells us we can lose our life, right? But they can't take our greatest treasure from us if our hope and trust is in Jesus. If simply your life is your greatest treasure, then all people have to do is threaten you and they have control and power over you. But if your greatest treasure is actually Jesus... Nobody can take that away from you. And so she's in this point. And she says, if I live, I live. If I die, I die. But I'm going to do what's right. And ultimately, this this whole story, as you hear this story, it leans towards, it's yearning for Jesus. When we get to the end of Luke's Gospel, uh, Jesus, we are told, went through the Old Testament, and he he showed how all of the Old Testament was pointing and pertaining to him. And so this little story of Esther is part of a bigger story. And here millions of Jews will be saved. But it's not ultimate salvation. The ultimate salvation is yet to come through Jesus, who saves not millions, but billions who saves not just from Xerxes, but from Satan. Not just from death, but saves from the wrath of God. There is a greater Savior to come. Now the problem is no one had access to the king, right? No one had a right to come to the throne without having been summoned. Esther alone is the one who's willing to take this on and take this chance. She has a chance because she's Persian royalty. God has constructed the situation to put her there for this. And she says, if I die, I die. But if I live, I live. And here's our problem, folks. Our problem is is worse than their problem. They were under the judgment of Haman. We are under the judgment of God. Haman wrongly judged. God rightly judges. Each and every one of us were under a death sentence because of our sin and rebellion. 
We've not bowed down to God. We've not worshipped and honored in obedience as we should. We've rebelled against Him. And the Bible tells us the sentence for that is death. And that we can't deliver ourselves because we have no access to the King's throne. So we find ourselves as sinners in a very similar situation to Esther. So what does God do? Well, unlike Xerxes, he gets down off of his throne, right? He comes down as the man, Jesus Christ, and lives without sin. You see, we can make progress because we are not perfect, but Jesus is our perfection. And Jesus says, if I perish, I perish. And he perishes. And he dies in our place for our sin. And he does it to reconcile us with the King of Kings. Only God could do that. Jesus is the bigger, better Esther. That's why it says in 1 Timothy 2.5, there is one God and there is one mediator. Just like there was a mediator for the Jews in Esther, there is one mediator for us. And that mediator is between God and men. God became a man to mediate, to reconcile, that we might be restored in relationship with our Father God. And that whole of the story of Esther shows this plight that we are in. So as we read the story, I want you to read it and ask, apart from the grace of God, how am I like Xerxes? How am I like Haman? How am I a sinner in need of a Savior? But then see in this story, there is hope. Because Jesus is my perfection. Today we're going to be taking communion in just a minute. And this is such an important thing for us to remember. Many of us have lived disobedient lives. We've lived lukewarm faith. We haven't been following as we should follow. We are like Esther or Mordecai. Maybe we've been living in open rebellion like King Xerxes. But because God became man, came down to us, If we put our hope and trust in Jesus, we can be reconciled. And all of that will be wiped off the books. And so folks, there is much hope for you. And I hope you hear that and you have that hope today. The hope is not in Esther. The hope is not in Esther. And the uh, hope is not in Mordecai. The hope is in Jesus. Put your hope and trust in Him. And follow faithfully. And the cards will fall where they may. But at the end of the day, he will say to you, Well done, good and faithful servant. Let's pray.